Tonight's hometown scrapbook. Kate Merhard. Hello there. We have a scrapbook open tonight to a story that makes me feel good inside to be able to tell you, for it's a story of a very remarkable person who lives and is active amongst us in Hopewim. Yesterday I sat down for a few minutes and talked with her, although I already had much of the story of her interesting and colorful life. And the extra details that I got from her interesting as they were, didn't impress me half as much as the lady herself, for she is one of the most remarkable young ladies I have ever met, young in spirit, young and bright twinkling in her eyes, though she has seen many good summers, and most of them right here on Grays Harbor. Her name is Kate Merhart. She is called Grays Harbor Home for 61 action-filled years, and today, with a rich lifetime, of all the good things behind her, she has a sparkling humor of one who has drunk long from the cup of life and found it very sweet. I'm going to tell you about her in a minute, but first I'm going to have a few words from Dick Crombie and our sponsors. Kate Hodes was born in Erie County, New York, January 10, 1867. She was the youngest of five children, being considerably younger than the others. Her first recollections of life in this world are being left alone while the rest of the family went to church, walking the entire seven miles and back again. They would start before daylight of a winter's morning, admonish the young, youngest not to get out of bed before daylight so she would not need to have a kerosene light, light lit, Often the parents did not return until three in the afternoon. It occurred on Sunday and on all church holidays, and the recollection of her loneliness, the cold and her fear, had stayed with her through a lifetime. In the summer she stayed out in the sun, waiting for her family's return and hiding behind the trees when teamsters drove past, always shouting, sometimes drunk. The fall of the year was the hardest. There was no warmth in the house, and the child huddled against the side of the building in the heatless sun, sunlight, her dress pulled over her bare feet. When she was nine years old, she walked five miles to and from school each day. By the time she was twelve, her parents considered her educated. They had moved during her schooling and were now five miles from church and two and a half miles from school. This meant that during her last year of school, she walked five miles to church three times each week and back again before school. Sometimes, she said yesterday, someone would give us a ride, but I often think how I walked in the hot, dusty roads in the summer, the snow in the winter, and the mud in the spring. When Kate was 16, her father took exception to her absence from church during a special holiday. That day he gave her nine dollars and told her that she could leave home. The next day she was 200 miles away with an aunt in Cleveland, Ohio. She got a new place as an apprentice dressmaker, Kate recalls. She lived with the dressmaker and worked for her board at a dollar a week. That was for the first six months. At the end of the time her wages were increased and she stayed there for three years. An elder sister lived in Michigan, and it was to the state that Kate moved next, even after the sister moved west to a place in the Washington Territory called Montesano. Kate remained in Michigan operating a dress shop. It wasn't getting rich. Kate chuckled yesterday. There was a deep depression on. My sister sent me money to come west, and I started for the Washington Territory. In May 1888, Kate Hotis became a citizen of Grace Harbor County. She opened a dressmaking shop in Montesano. It was a grand country, that early, that early one, as Kate recalls it. There was so much of it. With its natural beauty, its great vistas, 
and somehow Kate wanted to own a part of it. She had no money saved, but her brother-in-law suggested a government claim, a preemption. She knew nothing of the difficulties, but her brother-in-law knew a young name, man named Merhard, who settled on the upper hump tulips and was, lo was locating claims. Though Merhard, Kate filed on a claim in the upper hump tulips area, and shortly afterwards, at the suggestion of her brother-in-law, whom she recalls as always doing things the hard way, Kate, accompanied by her sister and brother-in-law and their small daughter, now Mrs. Lucille Cleland of Hoquim, set out for the claim to build a cabin. We took a boat to Hoquim, she recalls. That settlement consisted of a general store, the Northwest Mill, and a few houses. There, the voyagers purchased their winter supplies and such household equipment as they would require and started up the Hoquiam River in the Wishka Chief. At New London, a cluster of barns and houses and a logging camp they spent the night at in a warehouse. A rancher heading north took them another hitch on their way. The last five miles they hiked over the little travel trail, carrying the child and enough food for the night. That night they camped under a tree, and the next day Murhard, their closest neighbor, pulled their supplies up the river in his canoe. It was the 14th of September, 1888. They unpacked and set up housekeeping underneath a maple tree until they could do better. It was their, going to be their home. Then, as Kate well remembers, it began to rain. It rained only as it could rain on the hump tulips. For two weeks, it poured without stopping. It was a major project just to keep the little girl and the provisions dry. But they also had a house to build. Merhard offered to use his cabin, but since it had only one room, the settler's father, and the settler's father was living with him, they refused and remained under the tree. Finally, Merhard helped. The brother-in-law fell a tree and Kate and her sister was assigned to buck up the fallen giant with a cross-cut saw. We never got the first cut off, Kate said yesterday. We quarreled each other, accusing the other of lying down on the job. However, they did help with the work of splitting out the boards when the roof was up and moved in. They, they kept house while the dwelling had neither walls nor floor. The frame of the structures supporting the roof was their only protection from the elements. Kate can still remember the strange sound of the wilderness, especially the sound of salmon flopping on the river bank during their big runs. There were coyotes, and except for themselves and their single neighbor, a great loneliness. But their split board and building of walls, clinking them and shinking them with moss, they dried leaves and stuffed ticking for mattresses. Their furniture was made of the same tree that the house was fashioned. Their meat was mostly elk. The nearest post office was 30 miles away at Hopewim. Any settlers who went to Hopewim brought the mail back for all of them. Her sister's family stayed for, for four months. Then Kate remained alone for another four months before returning to Montesano to resume her dressmaking. But Kate had caught the timber claim fever, and when she heard that a new township was to be opened above the old claim on the hump tulips, she struck out again and squatted in another chunk of land still further up the river. She built a cabin, put her sign claiming the land, and went back to Montesano. Her ardor for another claim had cooled when she returned to the county seat, and this time she sold her rights doing quite well for the trip. Kate doesn't go into details about her courtship with Gust Merhard, but in 1890 they were married in the old Montesano house and went back into the woods in the upper hump tulips. This time it was for good, Kate remembers. It was ours, and I stayed in it for 22 years. Once she didn't come out for five years, and then it was ten years between trips to the theater. It was also ten years at a time in the straw hats and calico dresses, she laughed yesterday. 
Her husband refused to permit her to wear overalls, although at times she drove the oxen for plowing. We raised our own oxen for plowing, she said, but we had to have a hand to drive them. I had my choice of driving the oxen or cooking for a hired man. I figured I'd rather drive the oxen. But if she ever came out of the house in overalls, her husband would sit down and not move until she returned to change into her calico dress and straw hat. We were the only white people for miles, she said, but he still insisted that I dress like a woman. Don't ever think that I was unhappy, she cautioned yesterday. This was the first permanent home I ever had, and I loved it. Nor was my life dull in the tall timber. Kate recalled the story of the sauerkraut drive. A few miles above them on the river lived two Germans. When the first settled there, one had a wife. But the wife never saw another woman after she moved up there. A traveler passing through found them building a casket in a room in which the woman lay ill. We've got to get this woman out of here or she'll die, the traveler warned. Oh, she'll die, all right, said one of the Germans. And some day later, they buried the homemade casket with the pioneer housewife. The Germans were cabinet makers and spent some time during the off-season making barrels. A large part of their crop was cabbage, which they converted to sauerkraut and packed into the barrels. After sealing the heads of the barrels, they floated them in the river, planning to make a drive of them and sell them in Hoquiam. When the drive passed the Murhard home, the Germans stayed the night with the settlers. Mrs. Murhard warned them of the dangers of losing their barrel in a log jam located down the river, one not far from the mouth where it empties into the harbor. But the kraut makers persisted. The following day, they took their drive as far as hump tulips, only to find that the barrels had gone under the log jam, and all except one was lost. They sold it in hump tulips and returned home. It was the one and only sauerkraut drive that hump tulips ever saw. When you talk with Kate Murhart, you have the feeling that she could tell you a lifetime of stories because she had lived them. With her happy sense of humor and keen ability to recall the past, she has retained them. But before we continue, let's ask Dick Crombie to take a few words from our sponsor. Living on the frontier and liking it was only for the strongest, but Kate Murhard was equal to it. Her childhood spent in walking made the long distance shorter. Her spirit of independence made her more than a match for the wilderness. And they, then, Kate Murhart, had that something extra that makes some people capable of wrestling the last ounce of sweetness from the busiest lives of living. There were no problems to her. This is no insurmountable problem. In the year of 1903, six feet of snow fell in less than 24 hours. Her husband was in a hopium on the trip, but rumors of smallpox made him decide to return home rather than stay the night. All night and all the next day the snow fell, but he had returned to the claim before he was snowed in. When the snow had fall, when the snowfall stopped, it took him all day to shovel a path to the barn to water and feed their stock. If he had not returned that night, Kate doubts that she could have been able to cope with the situation. But those who know her are sure that she would have been able to make out somehow. As they developed their claim, conditions improved with roads and neighbors. They hired help, and life became easier for Kate. But in 1909, her husband lost his health. For two years more, they remained in the Hump Tulips country. They moved down to Hoquiam, where Gus Muirhoff died in 1922. Since then, Kate Murhan has lived alone, renting out a couple of apartments to augment her income. That is, she lives alone, but is not often by herself, for her many friends are almost constantly in attendance. There were several there yesterday when we talked, and Kate recalled the time that she made the trip from the Upper Hump Tulips to Aberdeen in a single day. It had never been done before. It was before her marriage to Gus Murhart. 
George Hubble was roaming the hump tulips country and wanted to borrow Gus's canoe to come down the river. Gus agreed if George would take Kate, his neighbor, downriver to Hoquiam. It was a bargain. They left in the morning and were at the mouth of the hump by early afternoon. There, Hubble borrowed a rowboat, rigged a sail of burlap, and rowing and sailing, came up into the harbor to Hoquiam. A tugboat was about to leave the northwestern dark dock for Aberdeen. Kate made a quick transfer and was in Aberdeen that evening. It was a record that stood long after the 1890s when Kate was at last in her own home, the home that she had helped to build with her own hands in the frontier wilderness that was then the upper hump tulips. Kate has no regrets for her life in the wilderness. She is glad to have had those experiences. And now, past her 80th milestone, this Grand Grace Harbor pioneer woman can still walk a forest trail or drive an ox team or make fine dresses or tell a good story. And so modest as she is, with a depreciating modesty of true personal greatness, that she thought this colorful story of hers would make a dull telling. Our kindest greetings to you, Grace Harbor Pioneer. Yours were the days of great accomplish, accomplishments, and you had the greatest reward of all, a laughing, understanding heart that recalls them happily and will live forever in the pages of our hometown scrapbook. Thank you for listening.